So we have a lot to talk about in the last week in terms of credit. I'm not quite done with the labor section. So what I'm going to do is just spend about 10 minutes just sort of giving a couple of highlights of some of the last, like a little overview of some of the topics that are, that are in the labor notes. You're welcome to sort of review them in detail. And then I kind of want to get into the credit stuff in, uh, in detail. OK, so there were two other um, kind of two other topics that I just wanted to give you a. The first is there's been some additional attention. And, and these are all sort of is what's happening in kind of the urban labor markets. So there's been some work recently on understanding kind of matching frictions. And in particular, you know, a big issue in, in labor markets is the fact that um, you know, not all jobs are the same, not all people are the same, so we want to kind of match people to jobs. Right? That's, that's a, a, big, a big issue that differentiates labor markets from, from other markets is kind of the rich heterogeneity, both on the employer side and on the, on the other side. And so, you, and so job search is a big issue. And how do you sort of, um, and th this question is sort of a big, a big one in kind of developed country labor markets. And I think people are just starting to understand how those issues may be different in, in developing country contexts. And, um, you know, one issue that, that people have started to think about is that we may, you know, part of how we sort of help solve these problems is we have um, uh, various signals that help us sort of signal in the market kind of what our skills are, right? So, you know, you, you know, or get a PhD from MIT, that like is a, a signal that you can take to future employers and say like, you know, I know some economics, for example, right? At least we hope that's a, that's a, a useful signal. Um, but if those signals are sort of weak and the, the quality of the signals is not as good, like it, it, th there may be some challenges. So one paper is sort of um, uh, trying to understand these issues looking in the South African labor market. And um, they basically, uh, they do some interesting things on this. They sort of look at sort of uh, giving people information about, and they sort of note that sort of these skill assessments tell you multiple things, right? In the MIT example, right, if you get a PhD from MIT, like that's a valuable signal in the labor market. It's also a signal to you that actually like you are pretty good at economics because like you managed to get a PhD you know in economics. So those 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 information they, they provide information both to the job seeker and to potential employers. So they they um, to get at this idea. So not with in, a, in a, not with PhDs for example. They they basically help people. They do a skill assessment of people, um, and they give them a certificate with a World Bank sort of brand like a credible brand saying you here's your skill your skills assessment or whatever. Then they also do sort of a second arm where they give the same information, but kind of privately to job seekers. They sort of show it to them, but they don't sort of give them a certificate they can sort of bring out to people. And they sort of, sh in, in order to decompose kind of what is the role of the job seekers from the sort of the, uh, of the information to the job seekers from the information to a potential employers. Um, oh, sorry, this is with without certificates. And so they basically, and so they basically sort of decompose this. So I'm not going to go through this in a, in a lot of detail. I just wanted to sort of highlight that this area of sort of how do we think about the job job search in general is an area people are starting to think through, and this is one this this question about sort of um, um, uh, understanding kind of the role of credible signals for employers in, in that is one is was one to look at, and, this, and it's a very nice paper. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I encourage you to, to look at it. Um, the other thing people are starting to, people are starting to look at sort of job search and online platforms. So um, you know, this has been a big move in kind of the, the developed countries, the, the labor markets, is the world of these online job matching programs. Is that actually relevant in sort of these, you know, in, in lower middle income countries? I think people are starting to think maybe it is, but you know, so that's something people are working on. Um, job training, there's a lot of work on this question of sort of how do we teach people jobs, et cetera. You know, is there general purpose training, specific training? You know, again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just wanted to sort of give you a pointer that sort of some of this work exists. And if you're interested in these questions, you should, you should have a look at it. Um, the second issue in labor market, in urban labor markets, that I also wanted to highlight, is the role of working conditions. And um, you know, there's this is an issue. I think if we think both about sort of the development, you know, the industrial revolution and sort of the area in the post, right, post industrial revolution in, uh, you know, in a lot of in countries like the U.S. or the U.K. Um, or all other kind of you know richer countries today. Or in a lot of kind of lower middle income countries today, like how do you think about you know or wor work? You know, what are working conditions like um, in a lot of these industrial uh, factories? Um, they're still not perfect everywhere, of course, but there's a lot of regulation. For example, in in uh, more developed countries, it sort of helps make you know think about worker safety and things like that. 
if we have large informal sectors, you know, that aren't sort of uh, subject to those regulations, you know, what's, what's kind of happening in this, in, in, the, in these lower middle income countries? I think to me this is a really interesting and really important issue and one that I feel like is, is not particularly um, studied to the extent it probably should be in the economics literature, so I think it's a really important area. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, like, you know, this was a, you know, there were huge sort of uproars about this kind of, you know, 100 years ago in the U.S., for example, um, about some of these sort of workplace tragedies. Um, you know, there have been similar sort of tragic incidents um, in, you know, there were a couple of very famous ones in Bangladesh about 10 years ago. There was a, this collapse of this, this factory that had many textile shops, you know, hundreds of, or actually over a thousand people were killed. Um, so, you know, how do we think about some of these kind of workplace issues? Again, particularly when you have a large, in, and why is, this kind of, uh, why is this kind of a development issue? Or, or it's because, you know, we think that sort of regulation actually is sort of what helps solve some of these problems in, in, uh, in, more, in more developed countries. Um, but with these large informal sectors, kind of, you know, the, the regulatory uh, issues may be maybe not so, may not work, so, regulatory solutions may not work so well. Um, so I just think, I just wanted to sort of flag that as something I think is a really important area. There was one paper uh, recently by Laura Bodro, uh, which I thought was a, ver a very nice one about sort of looking at um, uh, um, these kind of worker safety, worker management safety committees and actually sort of randomizing the creation of these in the Bangladeshi factories and kind of looking at some in I issues here. I think sort of what is, more generally I think, what is the role of multinationals actually and are they playing a role in sort of disciplining kind of the working conditions in kind of the factories in lower middle income countries that are sort of producing their stuff, I think is another, is a really interesting area. Um, again, I, I'm not gonna go through this in detail given sort of the, the limited time I have, but I just kind of wanted to just uh, flag this paper if you're interested in it and um, um, uh, just more generally sort of say that I think that sort of this, this issue about multinational, uh, issue about working conditions in general and multinationals in particular and what role they play is, a, is an important one and one that's a, a good area for future research. Okay, so that, that's all I'm gonna say, uh, and then I'm gonna switch gears. Um, do, do people have any other comments or questions before we switch to the last topic? Okay. So sorry I didn't get to go through those papers in detail, but there's a lot to talk about in credit too. I wanna make sure I get to it. Okay. Okay. So, um, Credit is sort of a, obviously a, a hugely important um, you know, issue. If you think about kind of like what we've talked about, um, you know, if you think about sort of the, the overall production function, right, there's like, you know, if we think about a production function that looks like this, right, we have, you know, labor, which I just talked about, human capital, which Esther talked about in sort of extensive detail. Um, there's some other components of this. One is like productivity, and the other is capital, right? So understanding kind of, you know, what are the sort of the, the, the challenges in sort of overall production in kind of lower and middle income countries compared to sort of the developed world, you want to sort of understand kind of all four of these components, right? So we've talked a lot about labor, we've talked a lot about human capital, um, we're going to talk next semester much more about uh, productivity. There's going to be a lot of discussion about sort of, you know, how do we think about productivity and how do we think about heterogeneity and productivity across firms. And the final piece is we should think about capital, right? And, um, and, when you think, and we're going to sort of split our discussion of capital across kind of what I'm going to talk about uh, today and, and, and next time and what we're going to talk about in 14772 next semester. And um, in particular, what we're going to talk about is uh, credit constraints. And so, you know, normally, right, if you just, you know, we're, we're maximizing this production function, right, you know, minus, if you were maximizing something like this over, you know, L, H, and K, you know, minus whatever W, L, minus whatever, I'll call it W, H of H, right, you would, you would choose the amount of capital such that A prime, sorry, A um, F prime sub K, is equal to R, right? You would just sort of, you know, maximize, choose your level of capital such that the marginal return to the capital was equal to the interest rate, or, or, the, or the rate of return to capital, or, 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 or which is, we think of as the interest rate. So what we're gonna talk about today are, are reasons why we may not be able to do that. And in particular, 
we want to understand kind of how does kind of the market for capital or the market for credit kind of work. And are there reasons why firms might not be able to get this much capital? Uh, firms, businesses, anybody who needs capital might not be able to get this much capital. It might be sort of limited in sort of their capital. So today I want to talk about sort of the basic sort of theory of credit constraints. And that's going to basically take me kind of all of today. So how do we think about why might people not be able to get <laughs> this much capital? And I'll talk about moral hazard reasons, adverse selection reasons, some monitoring reasons. Um, and we'll think about sort of what, is that, what does that all mean. And then, in, and then I'm going to talk um, on Wednesday about the role of microfinance and, and how we think about microfinance as sort of you know, one way of solving these kind of credit, or not solving, but ameliorating some of these credit constraints for uh, really poor, uh, indif not poor, but small, very, you know, typically poor, very small kind of microenterprises. Okay? And there's been a sort of an explosion of work sort of understanding you know, both whether or not microfinance does or does not ameliorate credit constraints and understanding all the many different features that happen in, in microfinance and understanding whether those are important. So that's what I'm going to do this week. What we're then going to sort of think about is in 14772, we'll think about the role of banks as sort of intermediaries and how to, what, are, what are banks doing? How are they allocating capital? What are they doing in sort of credit constraints? And more generally, sort of understanding kind of firms' demand for credit and sort of the impact of credit on firms, which you can think of in some ways as like estimating that FK thing. Right? What is the impact of, uh, of additional capital on kind of the firm sector? So we sort of split this topic kind of, you know, the stuff that we think of as kind of more, a little more, uh, this is mostly about, you know, people and so sort, of, sort of the basics of understanding these models I'm going to do now. The stuff about really sort of getting into how this stuff affects firms we'll do next semester. Okay, that's the, the plan. So here's the neoclassical model of the capital market. Uh, imagine that everyone faces the same interest rate adjusted for risk. And so what that means, is, now what that means, by the way, is if there's a D percent risk of default, um, then uh, so we're also going to we're going to work with what's called the gross interest rate, uh, which is how much so you repay the growth, which is often more convenient. The interest rate we think of is like you know so imagine I, I have a three percent interest rate. Right, so I, I would have to pay three percent of uh, in interest. The gross interest rate is like one point oh three. It's the total amount you have to pay back. Okay, and that just ha turns out to be convenient uh, for the math sometimes. So imagine I default. Okay, um, uh, and, and different people differ in their default risks. Okay, then what is the bank going to get back? Well, the bank's going to get back. Well, with, with probability d, it's going to get nothing. With probability one minus d, it's going to get the gross interest rate. So if the if there's a in kind of just the basic kind of market, if there, we have different chances of default and that chance is on, chance is, is exogenous or whatever and, and observable, then I'll just be happy to offer you different offer you all different loans. And the rate I'm going to charge the, the gross interest rate I'm going to charge for your loan is one minus d times r. Right. So I'm going to get back kind of like my uh, my my uh, my uh, my R in equilibrium. Okay. Um, and then basically, that's kind of what you get. Uh, um, uh, that's what you get. And then the, then the expected marginal product of capital should be equal to 1 minus d times r, right? Because that's the, the interest rate you have to pay. Fine. So here are some, um, some stylized facts. I'm not going to go into sort of the detail between these, but there's, there's, there's uh, some work that sort of. Um, suggest these are true. So uh, which suggests that maybe the, that simple neoclassical model is not everything that's going on. Um, so one thing is, so, so then by the way, one other implication of this, by the way, is that sort of the, you know, what, what's happening to depositors and what's happening to sort of the, the, uh, the people who are, are getting the capital should be small. Just as sort of a, you know, if there's, if there's um, Imagine there's sort of free entry into banks, then basically that, that sort of, you know, that gap will be kind of competed to zero, right? Because depositors will only get the highest interest rate, borrowers will get the lowest interest rate, that gap will be very small. So what do we see? So we see, first of all, there's a big gap between, sometimes between deposit rates, the, the deposit rates and, and loan rates. So it seems like there's a lot of money going in, in that sort of intermediary sector. Like, what, what's that about? Let's talk about that. Um, a lot of variability in interest rate uh, within the same sub-economy, and that's true even with very low levels of default. So we're going to see um, heterogeneity in interest rates 
that doesn't seem to, that seems to be some, maybe some, something else going on beyond just kind of defaults. So we'll see if there's something like that. Uh, even though there is ex ante competition in markets. Another thing we're going to find is that richer people seem to be able to borrow more and pay lower rates of interest than poorer people. And more generally, it seems like people who borrow more are paying lower interest rates. And that seems a little weird, actually, when you think about it. Right? You might have thought that uh, you know, maybe you're sort of the, the, the more you borrow, kind of the riskier you are, and maybe the, the default rates should go up. But actually, it doesn't seem that way. It seems like there's actually a, a positive correlation between sort of the amount you borrow and the, and the oh, sorry, negative correlation between the amount you borrow and the interest rate. So that also seems kind of interesting. So it seems like there's something a little more complicated going on in the credit markets. And, and so what might, what might that be? So here's a model, uh, a simple model that has, of moral hazard uh, in investment choices. So imagine that there's um, a menu of possible investments that I as a firm can choose. And they each differ in their probability of success P. Okay? And investment P ha is going to yield some return R of P with probability P and return uh, zero with probability one minus P. Okay? Um, so my expected return is going to be uh, E of P, right? And that's just going to be R, that's going to be the probability of getting the positive, uh, the, the return times the return if you get it. Okay? That's my expected return. Um, we're going to assume that R prime is negative, right? That sort of the, uh, the, 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 the project with lower, um, the, the, the project with higher probabilities of success are going to return lower amounts if they succeed. And I think that's a pretty general assumption because otherwise there would be like dominated <laughs> projects, right? So we can choose the best project for every P and then it, it would have to work. Okay? Um, otherwise it's not very interesting. And we're going to assume that this that's going to that's going to yield, and then we'll assume that there's sort of a that this this e function is concave, so it'll be an interior level of kind of the optimal project for maximizing expected returns. Okay, so and we're going to note by p star the maximizing uh, project for the, the efficient project. That's the one that maximizes the efficient return. Okay, so that just maximizes p star is just the max of this thing. Okay, so we we would like people to choose p star in some sense. Um, in addition to the project choice, the P, there's a return to scale parameter, okay, which is given by F of K, right? And that could be, you know, maybe that's going to be diminishing returns to scale, whatever. Um, but then you, so your choice is I'm going to invest capital K in project P. So I'm going to make two choices, a K and a P, right? And my return is going to be the, the P is going to choose the, the expected P, and then I'm going to scale it up by this F of K. Okay? Is that clear? So, like, you know, I could go into making, you know, I don't know, belts or T-shirts, that's P, and then I can choose how many of them I want to do, that's the F of K. Okay? Clear? Finally, suppose, how do we... That, that the investor has some wealth W. So if the investor wants to borrow, she's got a, it wants to invest K, she has to borrow K minus W. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the credit. That, that's credit, it's how much they have to borrow. Okay. The gross interest rate is R, and we'll have limited liability, which is if you can't pay, what can they do? They can take your, there, there's some collateral. You put, another way to think about it is you, you, you put up your wealth as collateral, they can take your, your wealth, but, but nothing else. Okay? So that's it, that, that, I'll just tell you that is important, right? Because um, you're, you can see why this is gonna matter, right? So if I'm, um, if I'm investing K and my wealth W is approximately equal to K, so I'm only borrowing a little bit, then if, if my project kind of fails, they're gonna, I'm going to lose a lot, right? They're going to take kind of almost my entire wealth. Whereas if my, my wealth is, say, zero, then if I, my project fails, I, I, I get nothing in that state, so I'm only interested in the upside. So sort of the amount of wealth, the amount that, uh, of collateral I have is sort of uh, determining kind of what share of the downside I have to, uh, of the downside of this project I have to bear versus the, the bank has to bear. And this idea, um, 
And so you, you can so you can immediately see why um, it's going to be nice for for banks to kind of want you to have some collateral, uh, and, and and in particular why they're going to want you to put some of your own money into projects is because that they want to make sure that you're bearing some of the the downside risk. So you're not taking otherwise you take super risky projects because like you know heads you win tails they lose right you don't the bank that that's not a very good deal for the bank, right? Um, and so you know. Lots of loans have this feature, right? So, for example, if you want to buy a house, you need to put, you know, 20% down on the house or something. That's basically saying they want, you know, uh, the loan to be no more than 80% of the total because they want you to have some stake in kind of like what happens if things go wrong. Um, there are more complicated situations in 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 mortgage markets actually because in addition. Uh, you know, often when the when the loan goes bad, it starts from the top, and so you, you actually you lose the, the first. If you have twenty percent down, right, the, the first twenty percent is your loss, and the bank kind of only loses it more than that. So actually, the, the ordering of it is important too. But we're not going to get into that in this model. Okay, is this clear so far? Okay. So suppose um, that we can contract over K the amount of capital. But we cannot contract over the project choice P. So, uh, so K is just is going to be fixed, um, but then the borrower is going to want for a given K, right? Once we agree on K, the borrower gets to say, okay, now I know what my K is, I'm going to choose my P, and they can't contract over that. So, in particular, what are they going to solve? Well, with probability P. They're going to get f of k times the return. So the f of k times r of p. That's sort of how good the product is times the times the scale. Um, and then they have to pay the interest on the amount they borrowed. Right. With probably one minus p, the uh, bank takes their wealth uh, and nothing else. Okay. So uh, another way you can also equivalently. We write this as sort of saying they pay the growth interest rate on K kind of in all periods, and then um, uh, they, they lose their wealth in, uh, uh, in this other period. OK. So the, the, the first order condition is um, that the, uh, uh, the F of K times E prime, E prime is sort of the, you know, the derivative of the expected value with respect to P has to be equal to the effective kind of the r times k minus w, right? This period, this, this part doesn't matter, right? Um, and so we're just going to get, so p, p times r, that's e, right? So the derivative, so p times r was e, the expected return, so it's just f prime, uh, sorry, f of k times e prime of p is equal to, you know, the, there's a p in here, so that's just equal to r times k minus w. Okay, so that's the, the first order condition. So uh, recall that the optimal P had uh, E prime of P equal to 0. That was a socially efficient level of, of P, right? So um, what you can see is that whenever uh, K is, whenever W is less than K, whenever you're borrowing something, right? So if W is equal to K, by the way, if it's all your own capital, you pick the socially efficient level of level of, uh, uh, socially efficient project. Why? Because you the, the costs and the benefits you sort of totally internalize. Whenever we have a wedge where you're sort of gaining more of the, the upside than the downside, that's going to lead you to take riskier projects. Okay. And how do we see that? Um, uh, we see that basically that's because uh, E prime is uh, is uh, is greater than zero, and um, and so, uh, because in order to make this thing positive, the, the, the um, oh no, sorry. Yeah, you're going to take more risk, sorry. Because E double prime is less than zero, we're going uh, we're gonna to take a little bit more risk in order to make this thing positive. OK, so the, the optimal product is going to be a little bit riskier uh, in order to make E, e prime positive. OK, and that's the, sort of what I was intuitively saying before. Whenever you're not perfect, whenever you're sort of getting more of the upside than the downside, that's going to lead you to take uh, too much risk than is socially, socially efficient. OK, is that clear? 
OK. Um, that's basically what I said. OK, clear so far? Yeah? All right. So um, this already gives us some comparative statics. So this is the condition that I just derived on the last slide, that f of k times e prime of uh, p was equal to r k minus w. So we can just um, uh, divide uh, through by, uh, so we can pull out a k to make this 1 minus w over k, divide through by f of k. We get the second expression here, e prime of p is equal to k over f of k times r times 1 minus w over k. So why is sort of writing things in that way helpful? It's because we can immediately start to see a, a few comparative statics. Okay. So the first one is we can see how does p prime depend on interest rate? Okay. So p hat. How does the equilibrium choice of project depend on the interest rate? Okay. So when interest rate goes up, e prime goes up, therefore p goes down. Right. So when the interest rate is higher, we're going to be choosing riskier projects. Okay, again, assuming that we're in a world where you're borrowing something. Obviously, if W, over k, if w is equal to k, then, then we're just at the socially efficient level. But assuming W is less than k, we have that sort of higher interest rates are going to lead to sort of riskier projects. Clear? By the way, stop me if I'm going too fast. Hard, you know, sometimes when you go through a model on the slides, it's, it's too fast. But if anything, slip, slip down. Higher two is R, higher R. Higher R. And higher P is higher risk. Lo no, lower p is higher risk. So higher r means higher e prime, but we have e is concave. So so to go, we're gonna go we're gonna go down on the on the um, to get sort of a positive. Uh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. You know, like you see, like you know, f prime is concave, and right, when the higher sort of marginal product means we have less capital. Same idea. Basically, is we have higher we have higher levels of. Uh, of E prime, or we're going to get higher levels of E prime with lower levels of P. Because e, e prime was concave. Because e, sorry, E was concave. Uh, similarly, we can say, like, how does P depend on the returns, right? Returns is sort of uh, F of K. That's kind of like F of, K divided, sorry, F of K divided by K is sort of what is the, what is like the return on capital, right? Like you, you invest K and you get back F, you get back F of K. So this is like the, the average return on capital. Um, this is going to be increasing for the same reason. This is, you know, because this is one over that, so it's, it, it, it all goes backwards. So uh, higher returns leads you to choose um, uh, higher probability of success pro uh, projects. And this is this one. I think is kind of the, these two are sort of like going to be the most relevant for us. The third one is sort of how does uh, p hat depend on k over w, or k over w is leverage. K over w is sort of uh, you know, obviously one over w of k, um, but you can sort of how does it depend on sort of what fraction you're borrowing? Well, we know that it's going to be decreasing. Again, we know that sort of when k is equal to, to w, right, we're at the optimal level. And as we start to increase k, we're going to be sort of choosing riskier and holding w fixed, we're going to be sort of choosing riskier and riskier projects. Okay, clear? What's yeah. the intuition for the second point? Um, so I think it's a similar one that basically, uh, the actually, I don't have a good intuition for the second point. Does anyone else want to give it a shot? Sorry, I don't have. Actually, I, I take it back. I don't have a good one. It's a little hard to think about because you're holding W over K fixed. Um, hold on one second. Let me see if I can give you a good intuition. Um, I'm sorry. No, I don't have a good intuition. Let me think about it. Anyone else want to try? Ed, do you have a good answer for it? No. Sorry, I should think about it. I, sorry, I don't have a good answer for it. OK. But luckily, I'm going to mostly talk about R and the other ones, because I do have a good answer for it. OK. Yeah. Hazel. So we're assuming that the borrower is risk neutral, right? If we assume risk aversion, would we, like, because they're taking too much risk. So if we assume that they were risk averse, could we get rid of that in the model? Um, if we assume they're risk averse, it's going to lead them to take less risk. Um, hold on, let me, let me think. What, sorry? No, go ahead, Hazel. Oh, it's like, because they were taking too much risk before, right? And then if you introduce risk aversion, they might take less. Yes, that, that clearly sounds right. If they're, if they're risk, but you know, the optimal, 
I think it's still going to be the case they're going to take. So yes, for sure, if they're risk averse, they're going to take less risk. That's going to shift the whole thing in the direction of less riskiness. And you could get that maybe the optimal thing is for them to get to get E star, but E star may no longer be the same P star may no longer be optimal because it's no longer optimal for them. So I think it's still going to be the case that if you think about sort of social optim socially optimal, including kind of the risk averse, like the riskiness to them, it's still going to be the case they're going to take too much risk relative to that. But yes, you're right. Certainly, if we add risk aversion, they're going to take less risk, and that's going to shift the whole thing up. OK. In the intuition, it's just you care about f times e. And if f goes up. You care about what? You care about f times e, ultimately, in the original objective function. And if f goes up, then you're more invested in the return. Uh, whereas your repayment's linear. Oh, I see. It, you're this relative to that. OK, there you go. Yeah, I think you're right. OK, thanks, Ed. OK. Um, the other thing I want to note here that comes out of this model, which comes out of many of these models, is there's a positive probability, uh, there's a positive correlation between the default probability, which is 1 minus p, and the interest rate. Right? So in general, we had like higher interest rates lead to sort of riskier projects. And we get that in this model. That was this prediction over here. And that positive correlation between sort of the, the, the interest rate and the, um, and the riskiness is a classic sort of uh, prediction of many of these kinds of um, asymmetric information models, including moral hazard models like this one. OK, clear so far? OK, so the final thing that we need to do is we need to add a, um, a uh, sort of a exogenous supply of funds for the lender. Okay, so the lender can go out to the capital markets, like call it Wall Street or whatever, and they can borrow at rate rho. Okay. So uh, they're only getting repaid, of course, uh, with probability uh, P, right? So their equilibrium condition is that their sort of cost of funds, rho, has to be equal to their kind of expected return, which is pro with probability p they get r, with probably one minus p they, they don't, and so um, and so that's going to going to determine their um, their return. So what is this going to look like for equilibrium? So there's two different things going on. The first is with this market clearing thing, which is that rho is equal to to p times r. Okay, so this is r and this is p, and then we also derive from the from the previous model, this moral hazard kind of equilibrium, which also gives you p as a function of r. Okay, so as I've drawn here, there's like a single equilibrium. This is going to be the equilibrium in this market, where we're going to have kind of uh, interest projects p down here, and, and, and this is and, and this interest rate. Okay, but the this thing is. I mean, obviously, this is not drawn exactly right, but but this this function here, I guess, is hyperbola. It, given by this rho equals pr, that's fixed. But the shape of this particular p hat of r is not obvious what it's going to be. It's going to depend on sort of the underlying kind of uh, things that went into that previous model. Like in particular, it's going to depend on this e function, right? Which could be, you know, we haven't sort of specified what that's going to be. So we could draw it like this with the single equilibrium. We can draw, it, it could look like this, um, which has a, uh, I mean, we know that it has to be decreasing, but sort of the shape of this thing is not clear. Um, so it could have, if I've drawn it like this, there are sort of three equilibria, right? Um, where, uh, where these are both, I think, the stable equilibria. Um, and here there could be two equal, so here there could be two equilibria in this credit market. We could have one where we sort of have really high interest rates um, and, uh, and very risky projects, or we could have very low interest rates and not very risky projects. Both of those could be, could be equilibria. Um, but you know it's a multiple equilibrium model. Um, you know, or you could maybe have a no lending equilibrium where sort of the again you have to sort of draw both of these things kind of going out uh, like this. Uh, but it, it's not obvious these things are necessarily going to intersect, right? And so in this model, there's there, there actually the, the the credit market could collapse entirely if there's no kind of intersection between these two points. Okay, so. Um, 
so this, this already sort of gives us some important uh, things going on. It can, be, it can already be an explanation, for example, why you might have you know, multiple different things going on. You could have kind of really high interest rates and, and really terrible projects, uh, for example. Um, or sometimes you can have credit markets that collapse entirely. Okay, and that just depends on the sort of the shape of these, of that p hat uh, of our function. Okay. Um, what's, what's happening with capital? Well, you can think of us as having derived kind of that optimal p hat of a uh, p hat function, which was a function of sort of the, the, the returns, the sort of the leverage ratio, and the interest rate, which is in itself kind of an endogenous function of, uh, of k. Um, so now um, we can, we all know, the bank and the, and the lender know that if conditional on a level K uh, and an interest rate, um, they're going to pick project P. They can't contract over P, but they know kind of what that P function is. And so uh, they can make a choice kind of collectively, like what's the, you know, what, how much capital would you like to borrow, right? So then I can sort of solve, I can maximize the, uh, over capital, uh, the return here, um, where uh, I'm going to maximize, you know, the the uh, the amount I, I I get times the expected return minus the the amount I have to pay back, uh, and and here I've just substituted in for the fact that like in equilibrium I have to pay back rho, right? So with probability p, um, I have to pay back. Uh, <coughs> r time, I have to pay back r, so I know that this is just pr, so I can just substitute it for rho. The, the mark and write amount. Okay? Um, what's sorry? Is still the same r or making this decision, or is the bank deciding on uh, this, this is contractible, so they can decide together. The, the, borrower, the, borrower can, the borrower can decide it, but the bank will be happy to do this in equilibrium. Right? The, the, key, the, the, the key thing we had to keep track of is once they choose k together or whatever, like this is a contract, then the borrower goes off and chooses p. So you, the key point is we're, we're choosing the level of k, taking the borrower's like second period choice of, uh, of p as like a, that, that function is kind of given. Okay, and that, that's just what I just said, right? We're only maximizing this over k. We can't choose k and p jointly uh, because we know that like, you know, once we choose k, I'm going to go do whatever p I want. Right, and we, we might do better if we could commit to sort of a level of k and p together, but we can't. Okay. So the that gives us a first order condition. So what's the first order condition? Well, uh, it's just f prime of k times e of p, right? Plus uh, the other sort of term, f of k times e prime of uh, of p times uh, p prime uh, times p prime, so dp dk. Okay, and all that has to be equal to rho. Clear? By the way, and thanks, thanks to Ed for helping me clean up some of my algebra on this slide, which I, I uh, had some issues before. But I'm pretty sure this is correct. So that's what we just had. What would be the first best, kind of, uh, the, the first best would be that sort of the overall return, right? F prime of k times the, the expected return should just be equal to kind of the market interest rate. So that would be sort of the, the optimal level of capital to invest. Um, but and we can see what's going to happen to the level of capital. So in particular, we, we can rewrite this equation as f prime e of p is equal to rho minus this term over here. Okay. f of k is positive. Uh, e prime uh, is positive. We had that from one of our uh, assumptions before. And uh, we also just showed earlier that, um, that dp dk is less than zero. Okay, you know, for, because of, say, for, the, for example, the, like, the, uh, the leverage channel, for example. Okay, so uh, what this means is that uh, if we have a concave function, a concave production function, then the level of investment we're going to have is less than sort of k star, the optimal level of investment. And, um, and sort of intuitively what's going on, what's going on is sort of, uh, you know, the interest rate is kind of high, kind of given the moral hazard, and, you know, there's going to be more of this with kind of more capital, um, holding the interest rate fixed, right? So, so the interest rate is already high. That's going to drive down kind of the optimal level of K. And then this sort of additional channel is kind of only going to reinforce that, right? So 
the interest rate is like high because we have the moral hazard problem. And then if you higher interest rate, I choose kind of a lower level of project that kind of makes the interest rate even higher and sort of we end up kind of in a, in a the equilibrium of that has a kind of a, you know, drives capital kind of even lower. Okay, and so again, that sort of says, look, we prefer to sort of be able to commit to this level of P that wouldn't have this problem, would give us a lower level of interest rate and sort of a higher level of capital and a higher level of return, but we can't commit to that. Um, uh, we can also show sort of similarly that dk dw is greater than zero for sort, through sort of a similar argument. Just stepping back, what have we shown? This is a moral hazard, moral hazard model where sort of the choice of projects was uncertain, or sorry, was uncontractable. And kind of the, that, and that plus limited liability led people to choose these risky projects. The sort of choice of risky projects leads to kind of these higher interest rates, which sort of leads to kind of lower levels of capital in equilibrium. In the real world, don't people often contract over P when they're like, oh, what do you want the money for? For this business idea. Like, okay, no, I don't like your idea. I won't give you the money. Anymore. Yes. So I think you're exactly right. So I think there's a whole, a whole lot of kind of like what banks are doing is trying to, you can think of a lot of what banks are doing. Well, let me also talk about the average selection uh, model too. Um, it's not obvious to me how much that they're doing. They're screening about the adverse selection kind of. They're def definitely trying to figure out P and whether it's the ex ante, whether it's the moral hazard part or it's the um, adverse selection part is less clear to me. So we can, we can come back to kind of what they're doing in the real world. I think a lot of what they're doing looks more like the adverse selection part. So the, the selection part is, the, is kind of the ex ante, which we'll talk about in the next model, is kind of ex ante is sort of saying like, hey, like Ishana, like what are you planning on doing with the money? What's your P? You could think of that as like, like that's ex ante trying to figure out, like we have different P's, like your P is this, you know, Aaron's P is this, and so on and so forth. Like we're trying to figure out who's got the good P's and lend to them. That's ever selection. This model would basically say like, I want you to come in here every month and I want you to tell me what you're doing and like, you know, kind of that very, very regular monitoring. Banks also do that, but that's kind of the closer to, to, to this one. So I think you're right. I think that you can think about kind of the whole, you know, a lot of the relationship between banks and their clients as being about trying to sort of combat these two basic issues. And if they're perfect at combating them, then this kind of goes away. In reality, I think we probably think they can combat them to some extent, and this is kind of capturing the residual. Other questions or comments? Okay. So question, to, like, would you say there are credit constraints in this model? What do, what do we mean by credit? We're going to talk a lot about credit constraints. Do we think people are credit constrained in this model? It's kind of a little definitional, but I'm curious. Like, what do you, what do you? Yes, no? We'll just say, no, because they can borrow as much as they want. Okay, so no, because they can borrow as much as they want, right? They're just choosing K kind of as, as much as they want, right? What would be the argument to say that they are credit constrained? Yeah. Okay, they must have more popular. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's exactly right. So, so I just want to be clear on this. This is a model where I think you're exactly right, uh, Kash, that basically like the, this is a model where they're not constrained in the sense that like they could get more K if they wanted to, but they just choose the, the optimal level of K for them to borrow is kind of but, the, but they're just gonna, the interest rate will adjust as they kind of like borrow more K, right? Um, and uh, and that's gonna, that's gonna um, lead there to be, um, uh, it look like kind of they're, they're, they're not borrowing as much K as they might have wanted to if these information uh, asymmetries hadn't, hadn't been there. Okay, so that's model one. That's the, the moral hazard model. Here's another model, which is the, an adverse selection model. This is an alternative story, and sort of going back to what I was talking about with Shoshana, this is kind of like screening like heterogeneity among projects. So now, in this model, we're gonna suppose that P is a fixed characteristic of an individual. Some people have high P, some people have low P, okay? So in this model, we say, look, suppose the bank offers an interest rate R. Who's gonna take that loan? Who wants that loan? Well, I'm gonna, uh, take that loan if, with, again, same little liability, prob the project fails probably one minus P, I pay nothing. Probability P 
I get uh, f of k r of p, that's my return. And I have to pay this gross interest rate uh, r on the amount I borrow, which is k minus w. So uh, if r is greater than, um, so, so p is going to drop out. If r, but if r is greater than, uh, sorry, big R, the return is greater than r, the, the, the sort of amount I have to pay back, r times the amount I borrow, uh, divided by f of k, uh, then I'm going I'm, I'm to want that. So um, if you recall from the beginning, we had that sort of the, um, that r prime was, um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, less than zero, that we had sort of the, the, the lower, the riskier projects were the ones that paying the most, the, the higher return projects were paying less, okay. Um, what that means is there's going to be a, uh, a cutoff value, okay, where people with, P, with, with P's less than some cutoff value are going to be the ones who are going to sort of pick, uh, going to take up the, the, the loan, right? R of P less than some cutoff is uh, the same as saying, you know, that P uh, is going to be uh, less than some cutoff, right? So, only, so the, the super risky projects up to some cutoff are the ones who are going to take the loan. Okay, so we can define p tilde of, of r as exactly that cutoff. So we can just define p tilde such that r of p tilde is exactly equal to this, and everybody with a p less than p tilde will borrow. Okay, um, and so what happens? Well, as I increase r, as I increase the interest rate, right? the p tilde is going to shift to the left, right? Because if I increase the interest rate, the return's got to be higher. Higher return projects were the ones with the lower p. So again, higher interest rates are going to shift that kind of threshold to the left, and we're going to get riskier projects. So we're also going to get that same correlation that we had from the moral hazard model, which is a correlation between the interest rate and the riskiness of the projects, although it's happening through this different channel. Right, one was this ex ante who wants the projects, the other is sort of the um, uh, ex post um, uh, who's um, the, the interest rates. And kind of intuitively what's going on in this model, what's going on here is like, look, you know, imagine the return is, is, is re the, 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 the amount you have to, in the good state, I have to pay back a lot, right? Who's gonna want that? Only people who for whom the good state is like really, really good. And those are the, the people who are, we're risky, right? Okay. So we also, so again, we have this negative correlation here. Now, what's the market equilibrium here? Well, again, we have that rho, that r times the amount you get. So, so here we have a slightly different condition. We have the expect, what is the, the, the p, that, for a given r, who borrows? Well, it's everybody with, um, interest rate with p less than that cutoff value. So what's the kind of average probability of success, right? Um, it is the, uh, um, it's just the expectation. This is, this is uh, e meaning expectation, not e meaning like the expected return. Um, it's just the expectation, uh, so sorry for the notation. Is the expectation of p conditional on p less than, than p tilde. And that's also kind of like, um, uh, we know that sort of as p tilde goes down, uh, the expectation of p tilde goes down. But kind of beyond that, it's kind of the shape of that thing kind of depends on just what the distribution of p's is in the population. OK. That also is going to mean that r, right, r, the interest rate charge, is going to be equal to rho divided by this expectation thing. So this thing is less than 1. That means that the, the, that the r's are going to be that are going to be charged to people are going to be higher than, the, than rho. So we're also going to have kind of higher interest rates than, it's not equilibrium, than kind of in the, the sort of the, than, than, than the first best or whatever, than that rho thing. But sort of the reasoning is a bit different. Okay, it's all about this ex-ante screening. And this, going back to, to your point, Sean, this suggests that banks are going to want to invest in doing everything that we can sort of say to like, to, to screen people kind of ex-ante and, and get rid of the people who are going to be kind of lower rho. Because for a given interest rate that the bank's charging, conditional on charging R, if it can like weed out some people who are kind of 
the worse, it's going to do better. That's not necessarily an equilibrium, but sort of th th that's going to be the banking incentive function, right? So I, I announce R. I know that everyone with P less than P tilde would like it. What I, how can I make more, even more money? Thought maybe I'll break even, but I can make even more money if I can find the really low people and sort of knock them out, right? I want to get people who are just kind of as close as possible to P tilde. And you can think of a lot of kind of what banks are doing in sort of that screening process is trying to figure out like who are the good borrowers, who are the bad borrowers, can I remove kind of the really bad ones? Um, so this is what the, e so again, we can draw that same kind of equilibrium. Here, it's, you know, this thing is sort of the same market clearing condition, but now we have kind of a different, um, instead of a moral hazard condition, we have an, ex an average, uh, sorry, an average selection condition, which says that, you know, here is the expectation of, of P, given that P is less than P tilde, where P tilde is a function of R. Okay, and that, so this curve here, doesn't come from project choice. This is just a question of kind of what is the distribution of P's in the population. This is just like a, a property of like the, um, the, the, the P function in the population. The, 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 like the, what is the distribution of P's? Okay, and again, you can draw that in funky different ways. It can look like this, it can intersect, it can all multiple equilibria, and, and so on and so forth. It's gotta be downward sloping, but beyond that, like, Okay, uh, clear so far? Okay, so both of those models, the moral hazard model and the adverse selection model, um, are gonna feature kind of high interest rates, right? Or at least like they're gonna, both of those are reasons why the interest rate will be higher than kind of the, the market clearance. So this is like, why the market for, say, microfinance, you know, the interest rate would be higher than, say, the, you know, the, well, you know, you have, you have a model where sort of micro, imagine you have a simple model where, like, microfinance institutions are, you know, raising capital on Wall Street and lending it to, you know, small lenders. This already tells you there should be reasons why the interest rate pay, so small borrowers, this is, it already tells you why the interest rate paid by the borrower should be a lot higher than the level that, that the bank is, is charging on interest rates, but it comes from the default channel. Um, so those models predict high interest rates, and they do it. And but the reason for the high interest rates is to cover the expected defaults. Um, so one unfortunate fact for this model is that at least in microfinance, uh, at least in some cases, um, interest rates are high, but often repayment rates are actually kind of high too. Okay, so then. That doesn't work in this model, right? Because the only reason that in both those models that the rates were high was to cover kind of the defaults. So if you wanna, if you, if you, to the extent this is also kind of a force, right? If there are reasons for kind of that wedge beyond the default rates, we need to add something else to the model. One simple way to do it, by the way, is if you thought that the, the, the lenders were not competitive, right? Then they're just charging markups. <laughs> Okay, that then if, if the lenders are not, it's not on the slide, but if the lenders are not competitive, then of course they can, they're gonna jack up the interest rate and, and, uh, and, uh, and make more profits. So fine, that could be part of it. Um, and there, by the way, and there are reasons to think that there may be non-competition in, um, in lending markets. In particular, this whole question that we were talking about about getting to know people's P's and sort of monitoring them, there's an important role for uh, information, right? So in particular, Imagine that you know I'm Ashana's lender, and you know she and I have been working together for years. I may have um, information about her P from my sort of you know years of interaction with her that like you know if Abhijit's another lender that Abhijit doesn't have, right? So that may mean I have some advantage of lending to Ashana over Abhijit, and I may be able to use that and extract some rents from that. Okay, so in particular, uh, that may be a, there, there may be good reasons to think that sort of the model of perfect competition is not necessarily the only model, is not necessarily a perfect model for this. For this. That's one. Uh, but here's another, here's another sort of model that also could be sort of relevant, which is monitoring costs. And in particular, this monitoring cost idea captures um, the, uh, 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 this idea, this is actually, it's not gonna quite capture it, uh, the way it's gonna be written down here, but it captures the idea that banks are sort of spending a lot of money doing stuff to kind of make sure people repay, okay? And um, so it's actually, it, it's not quite, mo th this model, so one version of monitoring is we have to spend a lot of money up front figuring out who are the good P's and, the, and who are the bad P's, that's one version of it. 
Uh, a second version is, the, is the, the, the moral hazard version, I think, that we were talking about earlier, which is to say, like, look, I'm going to meet with you every single month and make sure you're doing what you said you were going to do and, and not kind of deviating and kind of like doing kind of a, a worse project. Um, but a third one is maybe I can actually just sort of like uh, um, uh, spend some effort to sort of um, get you to repay. Okay, so, so here, that's sort of what this model's about. So, so let's so, so let's let's uh, let's think about about monitoring here. So, let's let's abstract from the project choices for the moment, just to make light and the project's failing. Um, but instead, we're going to think about repayment. So, as before in the previous model, suppose that if I invest um, k dollars, I get a gross return f of k, uh, with a gross interest rate r. And so if I have wealth W and I want to invest K, I need to borrow K minus W, and the amount I'm supposed to pay is K minus W times R. That's the same as before. Okay. But now, um, suppose that it's not sort of like the good state or the bad state anymore. Suppose that basically uh, I can just choose to stiff you and, uh, and not repay um, by paying a course, uh, a, a, a cost eta, right? Eta? Yes? We don't have an eta variant yet, do we? <laughs> we're gonna, huh? It's earlier enough that the promo card said presumably review. It just wasn't. It wasn't a big one. A big deal, yeah. yeah. They skipped a couple recently. They skipped the new variant. They skipped new, apparently, because everyone thought it was going to be called the new variant, and they thought that would be confusing. So anyway, eta, OK. Uh, uh, by cost eta, that is proportional to the amount invested. So, um, so what's going to happen? So lenders are going to provide uh, financing up to the point where the borrower is going to repay. Okay? So this is a slightly different model, but, but in this case in particular, they'd like to get paid back. right? And um, what's the borrower's choice? Well, the borrower could pay back and get f of k, and the borrower's net return if they pay back is f of k minus the amount they have to pay. Or the borrower could pay this kind of default cost, right? And get f of k minus uh, nu of k, uh, eta of k. Okay, and you could think of this as kind of like they come and seize my factory, or like you know, and take you know some share of it. Okay, so it's a slightly different, slightly different model. So if we uh, rearrange um, um, terms here, the uh, the kind of key equality condition is that R k minus W has to equal um, uh, eta k, or that k over W is equal to R over R minus eta. Okay. So, um, so in this model, um, this is actually going to give sort of a maximum amount the bank is going to want to lend you. Um, with amount of borrowing that's going to be increasing in W, right? The the more um, W you have, the more uh, the more you can um, uh, you can more you can borrow, and decreasing in R. Okay. So now let's suppose there's a monitoring technology. So um, the lender needs to spend some resources in order to make the borrower want to repay. Like basically, in other words, eta is equal to zero if the borrower doesn't spend any money, but if the borrower sort of like does some stuff, they can get you to repay, okay? You know, maybe that's like finding out where you live, like maybe it's, um, you know, getting to, you know, if you think about a lot of the sort of microfinance institutions we'll talk about next time, they maybe got you together in groups of people, and the basic idea is if you, if you defaulted, kind of other people in your group could kind of like impose social sanctions on you and get you to default. Like there's some cost we have to sort of create to sort of get you to repay. And in this model, they're going to say, suppose those are a fixed cost. Okay, it's basically a cost per borrower. Okay, um, and there are some estimates from this like old paper by Aline which says that maybe they're pretty high. Okay. And so maybe, particularly for very small loans. And this could also be a reason why basically like microfinance has really high interest rates because, you know, if I have to like find out, yes, it's maybe, it may not be, fixed cost may be a little bit much. Like it's probably def probably cheaper to find out if like, you know, um, Joe's dry cleaner is a better sort of like, you know, 
uh, investment, or you know, Joe's Taylor is a better. Joe's Taylor is probably easier to figure out if they're, if they're worth lending to than you know the Gap or something. It's probably not totally fixed, um, but uh, the idea that sort of it has this kind of large you know fixed component or sort of like you know definitely sort of not increasing very much seems kind of reasonable. And if that's true, that, that that's going to give us a reasoning why kind of microfinance is making lots and lots of small loans is going to have to have really high interest rates because they're going to have to cover kind of this fixed monitoring cost. So basically, if you're making a small loan, you have this fixed cost. You have to sort of like recoup it kind of on, a, on a, you know, in terms of an interest rate, it's going to be sort of a small, a large percent of a small base. Whereas if it's sort of a really big loan, that sort of fixed cost is going to be sort of much smaller. So that's basically what's going on in this model. Okay. So, so how's that going to work? So if it's a fixed cost, right? Uh, then with then the lender is going to just break even. So the sort of the um, their return has to equal kind of the market return plus the fixed cost. And so you know that's kind of that that's kind of it basically. If if the amount they're borrowing is really small, then we only have to raise the interest rate a little bit to cover this fixed cost. If the amount they're borrowing is really is really big, sorry, if the amount they're borrowing is really small, we have to raise the interest rate a lot to cover it. The fixed cost, if the amount is really small, we don't. Okay. Um, so if we had this condition from before, of sort of what the optimal level of uh, uh, the credit constraint is, we can sort of get the we can just substitute that in and sort of get the sort of the the, the return uh, is going to be equal to the market return plus this kind of this the, this markup term, which is going to be a function of their wealth, right? And that's just sort of combining these these two points, um, and that basically sort of for um, you know really and, and so what's kind of the point for really rich borrowers, right? Um, uh, for really rich borrowers, they can borrow a lot, um, and therefore, sort of the we can sort of spread that fixed cost over a small amount. For kind of really poor borrowers, that credit is actually really binding. We're not going to be able to lend them very much, and therefore, that interest rate we're going to charge them is going to be kind of a lot. And then you have to sort of solve. And then, of course, that has this additional thing, which is the interest rates kind of you know an equilibrium condition. So you have to do a little algebra to sort of solve that out. But that's kind of the basic uh, logic of, uh, of what's going on. So in this model, some people will never be able to borrow. Uh, and, and, and sort of this, this, this condition over here, if, if B is greater than uh, A to W, then there's sort of no equilibrium. Then sort of the, the rate would, you know, there's no sort of solution to where you can sort of cover the kind of the, 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 the monitoring cost with the interest rate because the interest rate gets too high and, and then they won't repay and so on and so forth. There's no solution to that. And, and if, if it's less than that, then there is a solution. And then you have this condition I said before that sort of R is going down with wealth is going up. So this is a model where we have people who are going to be actually credit constrained. Some people just they cannot borrow at all, right? It's not sort of this you know we can borrow a little bit. Here are some people just totally cut out of the, of the market, and we also have this have this thing now where sort of the people who are uh, borrowing a little are the ones who are paying the high interest rates, which is sort of one. If you think back to sort of one of the motivating facts I kind of gave you at the beginning of the talk, this is now something that sort of explains that, and that also is sort of consistent. Why we, we all consistent with sort of finding the fact that we have all these kind of like uh, very small loans having kind of very high rates. Uh, we also get, um, maybe I won't make so much of this, we have this multiplier property, which basically sort of that, you know, dr, d, d, d rho, sort of how the rate charge depends on sort of the underlying market rate, is, is very, this thing is going to be less than, less than, this, 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 thing, this thing is going to be sort of a multiplier that's going to sort of like make this sort of the, the rate be very sensitive to the underlying rate. So it also kind of moves around a lot. So, but I'm not going to focus on that as much. So you know, what, is it, what did this model add to, to these other things? Well, a few things. So it added, it said that there's a wedge between the cost of capital and the interest rate um, that was given by high monitoring cost. Um, it gave this sort of sensitivity when I sort of talked about it in the last slide. Um, it also implies that sort of subsidizing the cost of capital can lead to welfare gains because R will go down, right? And this kind of allows firms to borrow more. Um, it also suggests that these monitoring costs are really important because these monitoring costs are sort of what's like uh, sort of excluding people from credit. And this question of sort of how do we think about kind of what, mo what kinds of monitoring costs are going to be re really effective is going to be something we're going to talk about a lot more next time in kind of the microcredit lectures. OK. Yes? Two slides ago. This slide? Before. Uh, before. Yeah. What, uh, um, uh, oh, these lenders are not wildly profitable. That's all it means. So we're seeing these big spreads, 
but it's not like the microfinance organizations are like making tons and tons of money. Right? So that was sort of rejected. Like I said, this other thing is maybe they're not competitive they're turning rents. This bullet point saying, well, maybe it's not that they're totally making lots of rents. I mean, I think it could be part of it, but I think like in general, these organizations are not wildly profitable. A lot of them actually are losing money or certainly kind of breaking even, which suggests that it's not, although I think the rent, I do think the rent thing could be part of it, it's not mostly about rents. And that's why we kind of need these real costs. Okay. So the, the final, um, Final, or, final or, or, or penultimate thing I want to talk about today is this paper by, because that's all I want to talk about with the theory. Okay, so basically we had three models that you should keep in mind. Moral hazard model, average selection model, and kind of monitoring cost model. So those are sort of three, I would say like frameworks or tools that you should keep in mind as you sort of think through some of these kind of credit issues. Okay. So this Carl and Zimmerman paper was basically trying to understand how do we think about, can we differentiate between the first two models, average selection models and moral hazard models? And prior to this paper, there was sort of a bunch of, a bunch of previous papers who sort of said, look, can we test for asymmetric information um, by looking for like a, you know, a, a, say a positive correlation between sort of like the, 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 uh, the interest rate and the default rate risk? Right, that was kind of that. that was coming out for all of those, but they didn't really say like was it average selection or moral hazard because both of those models kind of produce the same thing. So they will say, well, can we actually do something to sort of like differentiate between those two? And in particular, uh, they want to sort of uh, so again, average selection is that some people the idea is some people are riskier than others, and it's a characteristic about you. And moral hazard is people can choose how much risk they want to sort of take, and that's kind of a character an ex post kind of choice. And so. Um, these are going to look similar in the cross section. Uh, we basically sort of talked about that, okay? But the idea of, of their paper is to say, well, can experimentally we do something to sort of tease those apart, okay? And um, this paper kind of pioneered this experimental design, uh, but it's now been used for many, many, many different kinds of things. Uh, and I think we may have already seen it already, but this is kind of the original paper, so I wanted to kind of go through it uh, a little bit. So their idea was, Adverse selection is driven by the ex ante interest rate. Moral hazard is driven by the ex post interest rate. And in the world, these are the same, right? The interest rate that you get when you, like I advertise and say, hey, I'm offering a loan at, you know, whatever, 10%. If you sign up for that loan, you pay, like the rate is 10%. So those things are in general in the world are the same. Maybe in an experiment, we can differentiate between them, okay? And we can do that by surprising people with an interest rate, with a change in the interest rate after they've accepted the loan, okay? So you advertise one rate, you get take up on one thing, you change it ex post, and you get something else, right? And um, uh, in particular, you can't, I think, make people worse off I can't advertise 10% and then surprise you to 20% because number one, people will be really annoyed at you. And number two, you'd still get a selection effect because people would drop out again, right? But on the other hand, almost everyone is gonna be happy with sort of an improvement in their terms. So if I advertise a rate of 20%, right, and then surprise some people with a rate of 10, there's gonna be essentially no selection difference because everyone who wanted the thing at 20% will be happy to take it at 10%. So you can hold your selection constant but get a different kind of uh, interest rate ex post. So that's basically their, their, their idea, is to, they have this other sort of, um, other dynamic incentive thing, but that's sort of, I think, neither here nor there. The, the basic idea is this, which is say, look, we offer, um, uh, we offer people either a high rate or a low rate, ex ante. If you sign up for the loan with the low rate, um, you get the low rate. <laughs> if you sign up for the loan with the high rate, with some probability we surprise you and give you the low rate. So now we have three boxes, right? And if we compare the, the high offers to the high offer, so, so if we compare, and, and this kind of middle box is kind of the key box, because if we compare the high offer, if we hold fix the high offer rate and look at the actual contract rate, this box to this box tells us the moral hazard effect, because you both selected in at say 20%, but only some of you experienced 20 and some of you experienced 10. And if we compare this box to this box, we get, um, 
we get the, the pure selection effect because both of you guys experienced 10% ex post, but here you were selected in as kind of having a 20% rate, and here you were selected in as having a 10% rate. And um, this design is useful for distinguishing between selection and moral hazard, not just in credit, but kind of uh, everywhere, basically. And so people have done this sort of thing in older, other settings to kind of like use this kind of surprise improvement to sort of differentiate between selection and moral hazard. So it's a very general purpose experimental design. It's also, I think, a nice example of how uh, an experiment can let you do something that you could not do in the real world, right? It, it's only because you have this ability to sort of manipulate and sort of ex post change people's, um, I mean, maybe you could find a natural experiment that sort of mimic this, but like, uh, in general, it would be sort of hard to do. Um, okay, is this clear? Yeah. One, one quick question is, in the, in the design that they're doing, the information, of, yeah, the, the adverse selection that they're picking up is some, like, bundle of, of the selection on, like, my type, but also potentially selection on, like, selection on moral hazard, basically, right? Like, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that just from, from this, like, two by two uh, sorry, say again what you mean, Aaron? So, so like, if with adverse selection, there's both, you know, I'm selecting on my P, but also I know how I would respond, uh, like, there's also, I, I guess, this, this notion that you can select on how you would respond to uh, different incentives. Oh, I think I understand. So you're saying there's a, right, so a general, in a more general model, in addition to sort of like selecting on just having like fixed P's or sort of totally endogenous P's, I have another thing which is like some people have different P of P bars. Is that what you're right. Saying? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So like not not anything that we've discussed previously, but there's this other dimension that you could model that isn't captured by the comparisons that we're doing here. So so what's going to so okay let's think that through together. So how what's going to be picked up here? So if we have so so you're saying we have three dimensions. We have sort of heterogeneity in P, ex ante kind of your your choice of P, and then you have this other thing which people may differ in their sort of P of R function. Right. So, uh, so how does that affect your interpretation here? I, I, I guess what my interpretation is that the hidden information effect that they're picking up is some like composite of, of the two different types of selection. That it's both selection on types and selection on slopes, basically. Uh, hold on, let me think for a minute. So uh, it's clearly the case Yes, I think that's right. So it's clearly the case if we compare the hot, these people who had the same selection, some of them got the lower interest rate, that's a pure moral hazard effect, right? right? Yes. And, I, and if they compare this versus this, then uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, yes, it, yeah, we, don't know, we don't know what, I mean, they're experiencing the same PX post also. So what, what, what we're getting is like, in my example, if we're both lowered to 10%, we're getting kind of group number one experience at 10% and group number two experience at 10%. So you're right, we don't know is that because they're like, what was the slope of their moral, of their selection thing, we're just evaluating, but we are at least evaluating it at the same point. Yeah. So it's still clearly sort of picking up kind of, a, I think, a, an average selection point, but sure. but yes, exact, whether the average selection is like a level or a slope and a level, like we're, we are at least evaluating it at the same point. Um, one thing I'll say is that actually, if you read the details of this paper, it's not the like, perfect, perfect setting to sort of map into the model. It's like consumer credit, and so like it's, it's a little harder to think about. It, I mean, of course we can think about the same issues in consumer credit as, as in firm credit, but I don't think it necessarily maps to sort of that model that we had in mind kind of as nicely as maybe it could. Um, but I think this paper was really innovative um, for um, creating this kind of general purpose. I mean, by the way, there may be another paper that like it. This is the one I think that I certainly know of as it at first. There may be others beforehand, but certainly it's certainly, um, you know, uh, th this design that they use here, I think, became kind of very popular, and I think that people have used it in a wide variety of settings. Okay, um, so you know, in the end, you know, I actually think the, the the results are not super duper strong. Um, they find a little bit of evidence of sort of a, the contract rate, um, you know, uh, not a huge amount on the offer rate, but you know, as I said, I, I want to focus in this paper less kind of for the the particular results they have, but more sort of for that design of how you might think about sort of distinguishing between adverse selection and moral hazard. Okay, so I'll stop here, and then I will talk about uh, microfinance, including kind of the reading you guys did on uh, Wednesday.